Show on WAMU 88.5, welcome. In recent years, there have been several cases of children being sexually abused at local schools by teachers, volunteers, and other staff. The same people who are supposed to protect students when parents drop them off for the school day. Joining us to explore what schools are doing in the wake of those incidents to try to stop sexual abuse on their watch is Donna Hollingshead. She is the Associate Superintendent of School Administration at Montgomery County Public Schools. Donna Hollingshead, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Also with us in studio is Giselle Palayas, Executive Director of the Center for Alexandria's Children. Giselle Palayas, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And Jennifer Alvaro is a clinical social worker, sex offender, treatment provider, and the mother of two children in Montgomery County Public Schools. Jennifer Alvaro, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Kate McGee also joins us in studio. She is the education reporter for WAMU 88.5. Kate, thank you for joining us. Good to be here. I'll start with you, Kate. Recent headlines from several different local places, including Falls Church, Virginia, Montgomery County, Maryland, and Prince George's County, Maryland, have featured similar upsetting details. Sexual abuse of children by staff at public schools. Can you give us an overview of some of the cases that have happened in the past few years? Sure. So um, a most recent case that's been in the news was out of Montgomery County um, earlier this month. Uh, a former teacher there, John Vigno, was sentenced to 48 years in prison for sexually abusing um, at least four children over the, la- the course of the last 15 years. He was a teacher at Cloverly Elementary School in Silver Spring. Um, and there were, according to testimony there, you know, multiple incidents over the years of inappropriately touching students, putting students on his lap. And um, after, you know, a third complaint, he was even asked to sign a pledge to avoid any physical contact with students. Um, but testimony showed that that continued, um, you know, in the 14-15 school year. And that case was really tough in Montgomery County because he was a teacher there for years and was beloved by the community. And so it was uh, many still supported him, you know, despite the conviction. Um, But the judge in that case um, said at the end that he, you know, couldn't agree more with the verdict there. Um, And he was, you know, found guilty of four counts of sexual abuse of a minor and five counts of third degree um, sex offense there. And. Um, in Prince George's County, you know, there has been a string of um, sexual abuse cases over the years. There were multiple at Flowers, Charles Flowers High School. Five educators were charged with a string of offenses, and all but one were convicted um, over the last, you know, between 2004 and 2010. Um, and there was uh, more recently in 2016, there was a bus driver arrested for abusing a few um, special needs children, young children um, on the school bus there. And a you know more high profile case that really led to some changes in the county was in 2016, um, a, uh, an elementary school volunteer who was also a former classroom aide was charged with uh, and convicted of child pornography. He uh, gave cell phones to students and had them send inappropriate videos and photos to him. Um, and he, you know, that was at uh, Judge Sylvania Woods Elementary School in Prince George's County. Uh, Deontay Carraway, his name, he was sentenced to 75 years. Um, and also, the, you know, most more recently in Falls Church, Virginia, you mentioned um, there was a, a teacher arrested for um, a, a sexual assault of two female students at a middle school there. And that case was particularly interesting because he had three had complaints and investigations at three other school districts that he had worked at um, but was still able to um, get a job in Falls Church and was ultimately arrested for um, alleged abuse. So we can see it has been happening in different jurisdictions around the region. So I'll start with you, Giselle Pelias. Kate described several of the cases of sexual abuse at local public schools that have been in the news recently. Are these incidents rising in frequency? Hmm. That's a that's an excellent question. Um, and certainly in the city of Alexandria, we are not without our own history of this kind of a case. Back in 2011, we had a fourth grade teacher at one of our local elementary schools who was uh, 
convicted for possession of child pornography. Um, and this was a pretty devastating blow for our community as well. And since then, we've been working really closely with our partners, both the nonprofit, nonprofit and public sector, to figure out how we get around this problem of educators slash perpetrators within our schools. Is it on the rise? I think that there is more reporting. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that this important conversation is happening nationally at an increasing level. In fact, this radio show in particular is another example of how this conversation is becoming um, more important and more critical for communities to have. And I think that's part of the reason why. So it might be that our consciousness is rising about right. it and hence more reports about it. But do you have any hard figures what percentage of child sexual abuse cases happen at schools as opposed to other places? So I work at a children's advocacy center, which is a national model for responding to cases of child sexual abuse. It pulls together a multidisciplinary team of professionals to investigate and facilitate those investigations, as well as ensure that those kids get to a specialized mental health treatment and specialized medical evaluation. Our goal is to get them on the road to survivor. Um, Children's Advocacy Centers have been in existence for over 20 years. And what we have seen since Children's Advocacy Centers have started, it used to be the national figures were that one in six girls and one in four, one in... One in three to four girls, one in about five or six boys. boys identified were, identified, were identified as child victims of sexual abuse. Since then, with education and training um, and more prevalent conversations about the child sexual abuse, that number has gone down to an identified one in ten children being victims of sexual abuse. I saw one 2004 study conducted by Virginia Commonwealth University of a VCU professor, a report saying that nearly 7% of students are targets of educator sexual misconduct that occurs in a physical manner at some time during their school career. But that, as I said, was 13 years ago. If you'd like to join this conversation, give us a call, 800 Four three three eight eight five zero. What measures should school schools have in place to protect children from sexual abuse? Are you part of a school community where sexual abuse took place? Tell us what happened. Eight hundred four three three eight eight five zero. You can send email to kojo at wamu dot org. Shoot us a tweet at kojo show or go to our website kojo show dot org. Ask a question or make a comment there. Donna Hollings had. In 2015, Montgomery County overhauled its practices for preventing sexual abuse and handling allegations of inappropriate behavior by school employees. What changes were put in place? So that those changes um, began with a multi-stakeholder group that we asked our community to participate in. To the board called for information from the community. What do you, where do you see areas where we can improve? But also information from experts in the in the field, um, content experts who could pr to could provide information to us about where they saw gaps in our, our um, policies uh, regarding child abuse and neglect. And based on recommendations that came from the group, as well as um, advice from national experts um, who helped us develop our, develop our um, all employee training, that was Presidium, um, National Experts on Child Abuse and Neglect. Our Board of Education took that information and built a more robust policy that will hold us more accountable, that would um, ensure that there were more open communications, all staff training, um, and that, that fidelity of implementation of the protocols that we had in place, that people were going to adhere to those because we would make sure that we had a really um, strong training um, around the topic. Um, in addition, our current superintendent has made it mandatory for all staff to take the training. That That's 23,000 employees, every single staff. Our, our superintendent, Dr. Jack Smith, is, is um, uh, frequently heard using the phrase all means all, and that is regarding student achievement, but it also is applying to our child abuse and neglect training, all means all, every one of our employees. So we have all eyes on the child abuse, and that we also um, um, make sure that people know what to do, how to how to recognize it, and how to report it. And so that 23,000 employees gives us all eyes within, but we also um, are, are um, collaborating with our parents through our volunteer training to make sure that our parents who are working in the schools have the, the necessary information they need to 
to recognize and report abuse. So this past past two years, we have 36,000 um, parents who accessed our online volunteer training, and that is a training that um, provides information about what abuse looks like, um, scenarios that would be relevant to volunteers, and how they would respond to that and how to report. Um, another um, group that we make sure are trained are our contractors um, and um, other people who work in the schools, of course. Jennifer Alvaro, you have at least two levels of expertise here. You are a clinical social worker who works with sex offenders uh, uh, providing treatment, but you're also a parent of yes. Montgomery School Kids. I don't know which level of expertise is greater, but either way, are you satisfied with the changes? Does the school system have your trust? Absolutely not. Why not? The school system started that task force because of my advocacy. In my professional work, I'm on a number of listservs dealing with prevention, treatment um, of offenders and child victims. And I, in a moment of complete horror, realized that on many of the listservs I was on, there was report after report of Montgomery County school teachers who had been arrested for sexually abusing children. I teach a couple different national programs on prevention. I went to their website. The policy I found was 20 years out of date. There was no information on background checks, no information on how they were educating kids, nothing for parents. Naively, and I'm not a naive person, I've worked specifically with sexual abuse for 24 years. I started making phone calls and got shuffled from one department to another. So I started writing letters and basically said, I can't find any of this information of first-year bachelor student in social work would know you need this information. Where is it? And to make a long story short, they formed the task force that Ms. Hollingshead is talking about because of my advocacy. And in light of information coming out in the task force, I not only found they didn't have policies in place, but what they did have in place blatantly on paper told MCPS staff to break the law. They were doing internal investigations when they had suspicions. They were not reporting to police and child protective That's services. That's a violation of the law? Oh, federal and state law. The CAPTA Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act laws of the 1970s mandate that specific pools of people across the country make a report to the authorities if they have a suspicion, underlining the word suspicion. Some states, Delaware, Maryland, every single person in the state's a mandated reporter. We uncovered they had a database of 224 staff members they were suspicious were hurting children that they had never reported to police or CPS. I can give you a list of over 40 people since 2001, 40 staff members, employees, contractors that have sexually abused children. There are case after case that I can prove to you because of Freedom of Information Act requests I filed through court testimony through court documentations that have come out in a variety of court cases. There are numerous, numerous teachers that Montgomery County Public Schools, spanning the course of five different superintendents, left in the classroom on written restricted plans to stop teaching children. And we got a listener comment on our website. MCPS has not made substantive changes to protect children. If they had, the Vigna victims would, from last year would not exist. The problem with MCPS is that these cases have been going on for decades without any substantive changes. And so John Vigna was allowed to stay in the classroom and continue his practice of lap sitting with the third grade girls. The question for you, Jennifer Alvaro, is what in the wake of the task force, in your view, has changed in terms of the policies being implemented post-task force? Okay, so first of all, they disbanded the task force with no warning, and there is now no outside party involved in the process. The only reason MCPS has made any changes at all is because a few parents got involved and demanded changes, and the media got involved. With the new programs they've put in place, I would say they're about a third of the way through the triathlon. They would have you thinking they finished it in one first place. What but are the other two parts of the triathlon that they need to complete? Well, they need to fully implement the policies, regulations, and procedures. They have not. They will tell Recommended you Recommended by the task force. Well, yes, and written into policy and regulation by the board. They're not fully implementing those things. This, John Vigna is a classic example. They investigated him in 2008, 2013. Internal investigations that they admitted had never been reported to the authorities as obligated by law. 
In 2014, Joshua Starr sent a memo out to all principals, and I was in the task force meeting when people sat around laughing. Well, people are going to have to cancel their winter vacations to get this done, joking around, that they were to pour through every single file they had to find any lingering cases of people they suspected were abusing children. Why wasn't John Vigna pulled out of the classroom then? Why wasn't he pulled out then? And yet he was left in the classroom and had multiple more victims. Those children were only reported because they taught one third of the safety class and a brave, 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 courageous little girl reported him. That's why Part he was caught. three of the triathlon. They need to, the state, the state needs to come in and conduct an investigation. No one has been held accountable. In other states, Maryland is one of only two states in the country where there's no criminal penalty for failure to report. In other states, people are going to jail over this. People with another state superintendents have been put in jail for this. Penn State, uh, Penn State administrators have been jailed over failure to report. Nothing has happened to anyone in any position of authority. Not a supervisor, not a principal, not an administrator. All these people who allowed the continual decades-long sexual abuse of children, knowingly leaving them in the hands of dangerous people, not a single person has been punished for it. Got to go to a break, but before we go there, I'd like to talk with Alan in Rockville. Alan, you are on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi. Um, I, uh, you had raised the question before, Koji, in terms of the uh, number of child abuse, uh, the percentage of child abuse that happens you know, at the hands of school employees. But when you talked about the training um, of parents, um, I'm, I'm wondering whether you also... Uh, educate parents that the lion's share, the majority of child abuse, uh, child sexual abuse occurs at the hands of relatives and, and close family members and friends of children. And I'm not saying, look, uh, no. abuse by the hands of school employees is abhorrent, but just in terms of parents' awareness of, of abuse in general. Well, Ali, um, Alan, the person you affectionately referred to as Koji, actually said that there was a figure <laughs> that there was 7% that was taking place in schools. That would lead to the logical conclusion, I would guess, Giselle Pelias, Giselle Pelias that the majority of it, over 90%, takes place not at school. That's right. Um, child sexual abuse happens because adults have been able to groom and form a strong and trusting relationship with a vulnerable child and most of the time that's at the hands of those who are the closest to the child family members relatives very close relationships with coaches with mentors with big brothers big sisters um school unfortunately provides an environment where very very smart perpetrators have easy access to kids Got to take a short break. When we come back, we'll continue this conversation about preventing sexual assault at schools. But again, if you'd like to join the conversation, 800-433-8850. What training should teachers and other school workers receive regarding sexual abuse? Send us a tweet at Kojo Show or email to kojo at wmu.org. I'm Kojo Namdi. Good afternoon. This is WAMU 88.5's 1225 now. Coming up today on Here and Now, the skies have finally stopped pouring rain on Houston, but now the real work begins. An update on the monumental recovery ahead. Here and Now, listen to it today, 1 to 3. Then on Fresh Air a bit later, today's Listen Back on 30 Years of the Show. Interviews with filmmaker Paul Schrader, who wrote Taxi Driver, and poet and novelist John Updike. That's today from 3 to 4. This week in This American Life, Carl's not a lawyer, but after his friend was thrown in prison and after three denied appeals with three different lawyers, he decided he couldn't do any worse than the professionals. I realized that the evidence which we would need to prove is right in the neighborhood and um, there wouldn't be anybody more fit than somebody who grew up in the neighborhood. Be your own investigator. One easy lesson is this week. Listen tonight from 9 to 10. Did you know the largest source of funding for WAMU comes from listeners like you who recognize the essential role of a well-informed public in a healthy democracy? Your support makes it all possible. Become a sustaining member with a monthly gift of 15 bucks, 20 bucks, or sign up 
at WAMU.org, and thank you for your continued support. Partly sunny today, the high 78, mostly cloudy tonight, low 65. Slight chance of showers tomorrow in the afternoon, otherwise partly sunny, and a high of 83 expected on Thursday. Welcome back to our conversation about preventing sexual assault at schools. We're talking with Donna Hollingshead, Associate Superintendent of School Administration at Montgomery County Public Schools. Giselle Palaez is the Executive Director of the Center for Alexandria's Children. Jennifer Alvaro is a clinical social worker, sex offender, treatment provider, and the mother of two children at Montgomery County Public Schools. And Kate McGee is the education reporter for WAMU 88.5. We just heard an earful from Jennifer Alvaro about what's not being done in Montgomery County. So before I move to Prince George's County again, Kate McGee, let me ask Donna Hollingshead if she'd like to respond to some of what was said. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, th- there are many parent advocates and many experts that are supporting our continuous improvement efforts around child abuse and neglect. And and, and one one incident is too many. So our goal is to have no substantiated incidents, not to stop reporting because we want to continue the reports. And in fact, from last year to this year, we've had about 3,000 reports a year of, of, of abuse and neglect that come in through my office. But the large majority of those are from things that are happening in the homes and in the community. A percentage of that is within the system and this past year. And all this information is on our website, so people can access these numbers. But of all those incidents, the, three, the um, 2,993 incidents that re- were reported last year, 309 um, involved an employee. And of those 309 th- that were reported to Child Protective Services, 268 were screened out, 26 were ruled out, and 13 were unsubstantiated. And of, the, of that number, 4%, 12 were indicated. So 96% of those reports of staff were um, unsubstantiated, but that doesn't mean it stopped there because within our own system, we then look at, through human resources, we look at the staff and, and do our own investigation. But we do this after we hear from protective services and the police, after they've conducted their investigations because we don't interfere with those. And while I'm talking about those um, agencies, we have a strong collaboration, a multidisciplinary team that we formed, and this is the best practice across the country where school systems, along with the state's attorney's office, with the Child Protective Services, with the Police Special Victims Unit, and the county attorney, we meet regularly to discuss cases and to work together to make sure that we've got um, reporting of child abuse and neglect and the, the appropriate follow-up. I guess reporting to whom? It seems to so, be called into question right. whether or not that reporting sometimes gets mm-hmm. past administrators in the schools. Yes, yeah, so the reporting is on a... It, this is part of the training. Every employee knows that we have a form for, for reporting abuse and neglect. There are four copies to that form. One goes to the compliance office, and I review, along with my staff, every single report. One copy goes to the state's attorney's office. One copy goes to the police special victims unit and one copy to Child Protective Services. So Child Protective Services is the first group that will determine whether or not they're going to investigate um, or if more information is needed. So I think in the over the years, when you see the, the, the last two years, it's pretty close to 3,000, although we dropped a few few hundred um, reports from last year. Those That doesn't mean that there's... Um, there's that that's a better thing we don't make a judgment about the reduction in the numbers what we do say is it's great that people are reporting and they suspect abuse we want them to report the abuse on to prince george's county kate mcgee prince george's county public schools has overhauled its sexual assault prevention measures in the wake of the arrest of the aforementioned deontay caraway the elementary school volunteer who was accused of filming students as he directed them to perform sex acts one of the biggest changes by that district has been encouraging greater reporting of inappropriate behavior but what has that shift meant for the school system and for its students Right. So, you know, CEO Kevin Maxwell said he really wanted to change, you know, this culture of non-reporting in the schools. And so this extra emphasis on reporting inappropriate behavior led to a huge increase in the number of um, uh, reports of uh, um, alleged abuse by teachers and staff members. Last year, the 2016-17 school year, by the end of the year, uh, 848 staff members had been put on administrative leave for alleged abuse reports, uh, and a majority of those employees were teachers. Um, And that 
created a uh, created a lot of chaos in a lot of the schools. You know, teachers were put on administrative leave, and often there's not a lot of communication to parents and other staff members about what's happening and how long a teacher is expected to be on leave during an investigation. So there was this need for substitutes. Um, you know, teachers were out for months at a time, and um, you know, other teachers were called on to you know fill in for teachers who were out. Um, for long lengths of time. Uh, and that led to, you know, some board members saying that maybe there had been, even though these um, this culture of non-reporting was um, needed to be changed and they, there needed to be rules in place and an overhaul, that maybe there was a little bit of an overcorrection um, on the part of, um, you know, teachers reporting uh, on other teachers or staff members. And so this year, the board says that they're going to make some changes within its training and within its communication to staff members about what is abuse and what should be reported so that they will see fewer teachers put on administrative leave because 90% of those 848 um, reports of alleged abuse were cleared by CPS to found to not be um, actual abuse. Um, Donna Holling said, how does MCPS determine whether a teacher should be placed on administrative leave? At when a teacher is um, indicated on any of these reports, then we would remove them from the classroom until the investigation has occurred by Child Protective Services or the police, and then we take our direction from the authorities. First, you, Giselle Peleas, and then you, Jennifer Alvaro. Do you think teachers should be removed immediately if there's any suspicious behavior? I think it should be immediately reported. And I think it should be handled and investigated by a multidisciplinary team. Well, Jennifer, is there danger in schools acting too quickly? In Prince George's County, as we've discussed, high rates of administrative leave are causing concern about hurting students' academic outcomes. At what point should a teacher be removed from a classroom in the complaint process? I would say when there's... So there's a difference between someone taping up, taping a piece of paper over the window of their classroom, which the windows are there so that people can be observed. So if somebody tapes a window over and you walk in and say, why'd you do that? And you say, well, there was kids out in the hallway painting. It was distracting. Okay. You tell them that's a clear violation of our rules and uh, of our code of conduct. Don't do it again. You make note of that. If they, There's no reason to pull that person out. But you have a track record there, right? to see if more comes forward. I don't think that person should be taken out. However, if you have, as in the case of John Vigna, a fire marshal on one day and a building services worker on another day screaming at the man, get those kids off your lap, that's somebody that should come out until an investigation is completed. So I think that there's a continuum of things that are flags, red signs, warning signs, and then there's very egregious things happening that that should somebody come out right away? Yes. Could somebody be kind of clueless or could they be a predator? That can all come out once reports are made. But I do think, no, I don't think there's a one size fits all. I don't think everybody should be immediately yanked out. All right, let's go to the phones. Here now is Debbie Feinstein, who identifies that she is with the Montgomery County State's Attorney's Office. Debbie Feinstein, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, good afternoon, Kojo. Thanks for taking my call. I just wanted to make a couple of comments um, in support of what, what Donna was describing with respect to the collaborative relationship that we have going on in Montgomery County. I'm chief of the Special Victims Division here, and uh, my division prosecutes all of the cases of child abuse that occur in our county. And uh, a number of the things I was glad to hear were being said by a number of the um, the panelists that you have there today. Um, first and foremost, I think it's really important for your listeners to, to know that while there are incidents that occur in our school systems, the vast, vast majority of the incidents of sexual abuse occur at home um, or by a trusted adult or by someone that has care and custody over a child. And we should all be aware of the signs and symptoms relating to sexual abuse as a general matter. 
um, not just for focusing specifically on our on our educators. That having been said, over the last several years, I've been involved with the process that Montgomery County has set up in order to shore up their reporting system and to ensure that the cases come to investigators in a direct and timely fashion, that internal investigations are not being conducted by the schools. Um, so we've really made a great effort together and collaboratively to make sure that justice is accomplished and that the right um, the right people are charged, um, held accountable for what they've done, um, as well as making sure that we're, you know, weeding out complaints that um, maybe do not have a basis. And I think that's also important to note. Um, but it's that collaborative effort that really makes a difference. I think, finally, the last thing that I would comment on is the fact that Montgomery County has implemented this broad training um, has reaped very positive results with respect to the number of substantiated reports that come forward. For example, um, because we have the, I think Donna said, 23,000 employees that are receiving the training around child abuse and the 30,000 plus volunteers, contractors, um, and other individuals that are receiving the training around child abuse, Montgomery County has effectively put out there training and education on the issue of child abuse, on the issue of all of this, abuse, all of thousands this, and thousands of people, which has resulted in Debbie, many, many more reports. Debbie, all forward. of this sounds good, but let me just repeat. John Vigna, starting in 2008, was cited multiple times by school administrators for inappropriate physical contact, yet he remained in the classroom even after MCS put all of the policy changes that you are lauding in place. Despite his conviction, of course, many people are supportive of him and believe he is innocent, but how did that fall through the cracks? And please don't say I can't comment on this case. <laughs> So the case is, is a public matter, and the defendant has been sentenced, as was mentioned earlier, to 40-plus years uh, of incarceration for the offenses he committed um, that were prosecuted by my division at the state's attorney's office. Uh, what I can't comment on was, is what Montgomery County did or did not do prior to my engagement with them in, I think, 2015. We started our collaborative efforts. The child that reported the offenses in 2015 reported as a result of taking a body safety class, which was one of the changes that Montgomery County implemented. In 2015, and we were then able to investigators intervened immediately, and uh, the case was able to be established, and justice was a, was able to be sought. Again, I can't comment on what happened prior to 2015. I was not engaged in that process. Certainly, there are great concerns around the fact that there were multiple reports. But I think what's important from our office's perspective, and what we've talked a lot about in these collaborative discussions, is that we are looking forward. And since our engagement together in 2015, um, we haven't seen uh, an incident falling through the cracks in the way that that fell through uh, those incidents. And I certainly don't, um, I certainly don't, uh, I wouldn't say that that's a good thing that those didn't come forward. And certainly, and I would, you know, confirm what Ms. Alvaro was saying with respect to the fact that children who were in the classroom in 2015 were affected by the fact and were ultimately victimized after these reports had been made previously. Um, but I can't comment about what Montgomery County did or don't do. I don't work for the school system. But okay. I can tell you that the efforts that we've put into place since then, we haven't seen a situation like that arise since that time. Okay, thank you very much for your call. Giselle, you first. The most recent sexual abuse case at Montgomery County Public Schools follows others, including the arrest of a contract worker and substitute teacher in 2014. Many parents were angry that the school system did not inform them immediately of those men's arrests. How much information can and should a school provide parents about what's happening? I think it's very important that schools are as transparent as possible with parents um, and do everything they can from the beginning to establish a partnership, an engagement with them around issues of communication and safe child safety and child protection. In the city of Alexandria, I, I want to talk about what happened to our jurisdiction back in 2011 because it was devastating to our school community to hear on the news, the evening news and on the radio, about a fourth grade teacher being arrested and go to the school and have their child talk to them about how, how traumatizing it was to see Mr. Coleman walked out of the school in handcuffs. We pulled together... Um, myself, uh, the representative from the Children's Advocacy Center, the sergeant from the Special Victims Unit, and the head of the Child Protective Services Unit sat down with the school superintendent and school, the school principal and social worker of that particular 
elementary school and held an open meeting with all the parents to address their concerns about the way in which the notification happened and the next steps and, and how they could talk to their children about this particular incident. I think that communication is critical and as soon as possible, parents don't want to be blindsided. They but, want to know immediately. But obviously, Jennifer Alvaro, there are also legal issues involved here. Um, as a parent, when do you think uh, parents should be providing information that someone has been accused of being involved in possible sexual abuse? I think as soon as uh, the police department clears that, mm -hmm. you wouldn't ever want to do it. When you say as soon as the police department clears that, Correct. as soon as the police department... There are legitimate reasons why, in some circumstances, that information should not be made public. It may jeopardize the investigation. If you send out a letter like that and they haven't fully gotten search warrants to get computers or cell phones or something, information could be destroyed, victims could be threatened. Um, so as soon as the police department or Child Protective Services says, okay, you're good to go, that information should go out immediately. And wait, allow me to interrupt for a second, because the point at which the police department or Child Protective Services says you're good to go, mm -hmm. that's an indication that there is some validity to the complaint? Yes. Okay, because I'm thinking... Obviously, if I am a teacher and somebody makes a complaint against me and the next thing I know, parents have a letter saying that right. a complaint has been made against me without any investigation. No, absolutely that not. That shouldn't okay. happen. I would also suggest that there are cases where criminal charges in some circumstances could not be pressed. And with Child Protective Services, the information didn't rise to the level they could legally make a substantiated finding. However, because of the person's egregious behavior, their license are suspended or revoked. Parents should be notified then, and they're not being notified about people in those cases. They're never notified about people with Child Protective Services findings. Got to take a short break. When we come back, we'll be continuing this conversation about preventing sexual assault at schools and inviting your calls at 800-433-8850. How harshly should school personnel be disciplined for alleged suspicious or inappropriate behavior? And... Importantly, what education should students receive about sexual abuse and at what age? Do you talk about the topic at home with your kids? And if so, how? Give us a call, 800-433-8850. I'm Kojo Namdi. Good afternoon. This is WAMU 88.5, and you're listening to The Kojo Namdi Show. Coming up today in a few minutes on Here and Now, the skies have finally stopped pouring rain on Houston, but now the real work begins. An update on the monumental recovery ahead. That story much more. One to three today on WAMU. Stay tuned. It's easy to look at headlines to get a sense of the news. Nine senators rejected that Senate version of the bill. Venezuela was paralyzed by strikes and protests. This missile can actually travel much farther than... All Things Considered digs into the center of the story to help you really understand not just what's happening, but why. Stand with the facts. Listen every day. All Things Considered today, 4 to 8, Marketplace from 6 to 6.30. Do you know the largest source of funding for WAMU comes from listeners like you who recognize the essential role of a well-informed public in a healthy democracy? Your support makes it all possible. Become a sustaining member with a monthly gift of $15 or $20. Sign up at WAMU.org. And thank you. Partly sunny today, the high 78, mostly cloudy tonight, low 65. Slight chance of showers tomorrow in the afternoon. Otherwise, partly sunny with a high of 83 expected on Thursday. Support for WAMU comes from Sleep Number, now offering beds with Sleep IQ technology, allowing you to choose custom firmness, comfort, and support, while also monitoring vital signs to track how you're sleeping. Available now at a local Sleep Number store. Welcome back to our conversation about preventing sexual assault in schools. You can join that conversation by calling 800-433-8850. Donna Hollingshead, um, identifying inappropriate behavior by adults at schools is important, but so is preventing dangerous people from entering the building in the first place. What is the MCPS protocol for screening, not just mm -hmm. teachers, but also volunteers, chaperones, mm -hmm. bus drivers, and the like? Right. So for our employees, um, prior to hiring, they go through um, a criminal background check, and also for... Um, 
all the other, um, that's the employees. But for other categories of people, contractors, they also need to go through a criminal background check and take our online volunteer training. Um, we have other groups of the parent volunteers, if they're going to go on a field trip that's overnight, they have to go through a criminal background check as well. If they are um, just volunteering the school during the day, then they take the online training. Um, this is all um, to make sure that our students are safe. We also have for visitors that come into the school that aren't volunteers, there's a visitor management system where people have to be scanned and using their ID, and that's checked against the National Registry of Sex Offenders. Giselle Pillai is a Falls Church middle school teacher who was recently arrested for sexually assaulting two students, had previously worked at and been dismissed from three different school districts over reports of inappropriate behavior. Are local school systems communicating with one another to try to prevent this from happening? Are there, are, are there legal issues involved, as I was discussing earlier with Jennifer Alvaro? I would hope so. I, I, there should be strong criminal background checks and child protective services background checks that include not only where you are currently living, but also all of your previous past addresses. Are there, how, how common is the problem of dangerous people moving between and among different school systems? Jennifer? Um, Pat Toomey, Senator Pat Toomey out of Pennsylvania actually got some national legislation passed on this. It's so prevalent and so common, it has a name. It's called Pass the Trash. It is so common for educators to be allowed to quit or to be told you need to resign um, and they just move from one school system to another. They move from public schools to private schools, from private schools to public schools. They move into another state. And he got some legislation passed on a national level to make Same that illegal. To, to say you can't let people quit and you can't you can't let people resign when they're under suspicion of sexually abusing children. But how can you pass on information that they're under suspicion from one jurisdiction to another if there has not been sufficient investigation to allow you to pass on that jurisdiction without facing legal consequences? Right. I'm not quite sure about that, Kojo. I'm not an attorney and I don't work in HR. But what I do know is that it's a massive problem nationwide. There's a group called Sesame Stop Educator Misconduct and Sexual Abuse that's working on this on a national level. It's so prevalent. It's so common and it's such a massive issue. I think, I think it's also about strong employee codes of, contact, yes. of conduct yes. and mm -hmm. also about very specific policies and procedures related to checking references yes as well as the background checks uh, 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 donna you wanted to say donna hollingshead right two two points about that uh, mcps did um a developed employee code of conduct um that really summarized legitimate standards for all of our staff and there are standards for for their conduct and what our expectations are for our employees and um, so that that is intent so holding our our employees to a higher standard than the law around um, child abuse and neglect so even if a, if a a case is unfounded by Child Protective Services unsubstantiated, then we in our Human Resources Department will then take that further and do our own investigation after we've been given the go-ahead. And also the Code of Maryland um, regulations requires that if uh, there is a, um, a charge against a certificated employee um, and they include um, a dismissal or resignation, that then that the information goes to the state and that the certifications are, are checked in and revoked as appropriate. On to the telephones. Here is Dana in Ellicott City, Maryland. Dana, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Thank you. I was, I'm wondering, I've worked in the school system, and um, is it the unions that are protecting these educators, predators, um, that prevent the school officials from punishing these offenders? I'm curious, I, Kate McGee, how has the PGEA in Prince George's County re, um, responded to the fact that there are so many, it would appear, teachers on suspicion who are removed from the classroom? I mean, the union. I mean, the Prince George's Educator, Edu Educators Association. Sure. Right? Um, the union, you know, they say that their first um, responsibility and their first priority is the safety of students, but that, you know, there are cases um, where, you know, teachers do have rights and they have a right to an investigation and um, that they, you know, there are times when 
these accusations um, do not come, um, are not true. And in Prince George's County, in my reporting from this past year, you know, I spoke to multiple teachers who said, and parents who said that there were students who knew that this was happening and were falsely accusing teachers of abuse. And so that was an, an, a kind of an additional wrinkle to this problem uh, in Prince George's County. But the union, um, you know, protect, they do, they are protective of their teachers and, and say that they, they do have the rights to the investigation, even though they say that, you know, child safety is the first priority. Thank you for your call, Dana. We move on now to Liz Payne, who identifies herself as being with Fairfax County Public Schools. Liz Payne, your turn. Uh, thank you for taking my call, Kojo. Um, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about educating children, yes. and I just wanted to share that in Fairfax County, we start abuse prevention in kindergarten, where we talk about good touch, bad touch, um, and we also send a letter home to parents at the end of our lessons to let them know what students have been learning and some things that they can talk with their child about. So I'm, I'm not sure it's it's ever too young um, to start making a child feel empowered to say no when they're uncomfortable. Okay, thank you very much for your call, Donna. Um, the personal body safety lessons are also um, implemented in Montgomery County Public Schools grades K through 12. So there again, that's um, you know 161,000 students also aware of what child abuse and neglect looks like and how to report. And it's all age appropriate. So by grade, um, your caller just mentioned the good touch, bad touch. So for the young children, we um, we want to make sure that they understand that you know if someone is to touch them, not it wouldn't be where your baby suit would touch your body so you know it's age appropriate um and then they understand and of course as we go up the grades and it becomes um more and more information about how to uh, report respond and, and to get help from the adults Gisela, our region school systems and even the schools within each district are inconsistent about whether they encourage personnel to report directly to child protective services or to speak to administrators mm -hmm. first what difference does that make it can make a huge difference. Um, Jennifer uh, spoke earlier about how um, MCS had different internal policies within each school. I don't think that's the case anymore. I do know that in the city of Alexandria, every single employee of our school system is a mandated reporter. And that's emphasized to every single employee of our school system. Now, each principal might want, as a courtesy, to be notified if a social worker or a teacher is making a report, but each teacher, each social worker, each psychologist, each school nurse knows that they also need to contact the authorities. You've conducted sexual assault prevention training for faculty at Alexandria County Public Schools. That training, known as Stewards of Children, is the same program many other local school systems use, but often not all teachers are being trained. Why not? That's right. Um, so Stewards of Children is a, a curriculum created by Darkness to Light, www.d2l.org. It is a curriculum that is focused on empowering adults to recognize, react, respond, and report to cases of child sexual abuse. It actually takes the onus of responsibility off of the kids. I agree with Dr. Hollingshead that education of children um, and the caller as well, that education of of children about body safety and what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, um, what boundaries should be established is critical. And I would counter that that should start at zero, age zero, not kindergarten. That, that starts at home. Um, but the, the Stewards of Children program is specifically for adults. Um, what, we, what we're trying to do is partner with our educators and with our teachers to not only be open and willing to ask que ask kids questions about what might be happening to them, but also to hold each other accountable for Can acting appropriately. Go ahead, please, Jennifer. Class. Thank you. I'd just like to chime in on a couple of things here. Um, I think that it's critical to talk to our kids in starting in infancy, but it's critical to talk about good, bad, and confusing touches. Confusing is critical there. So for listeners here, you don't please don't only talk about good or bad. Please also talk because about confusing. Because we got a listener in Sharpsburg, Maryland, who sent us a question. Who decides whether or not to report a report of abuse is true or not? Our teachers are responsible for, in large part, helping to raise our children. How do you raise a child without touching them? Well, so I, I don't. 
I don't want my own children to be raised without being touched. It would be a horrible, awful place to raise children. I've seen teachers hug my kids, and I thought it was nice. Um, I don't I don't want kids being raised in a world where they're not being touched. But, but it kind of a thumb mark that I go by, I recommend people go by, is the acronym PAN, like a frying pan. Is it public? Is it appropriate? Is it non-sexual? So if a little guy wipes out on the playground and is crying and somebody scoops him up, plops him next to him on the bench, gives him a side hug, rubs, their, rubs the dirt off their knee and says, you're okay, bud. Go back out there. Great. I think that's fabulous. Is a 12-year-old sitting on a teacher's lap ever appropriate? Absolutely not. Here, though, is another possible consequence. April and La Plata, Merrill. And April, you only have about a minute. Go ahead, please. Thank you. I'm uh, actually in Hyattsville, and I do have a child in the Prince George's County Public School. And his principal was suspended last year, and a teacher was. And like many, many schools, an administrator, a teacher is out for months. And I'm, I'm also a lawyer. And I'm really anxious slash angry about a process that takes top quality administrators and teachers out for months. And months. But did you have, did, do you have any idea why your assistant principal was removed? Well, he's back now. He was cleared at the end of the year, whatever it quote unquote was. I, and I, I think it's kept secret, and of course I don't know. He is back. Of course he was cleared. He's an excellent administrator. So whatever it was, it, it was not found to be ba- in good basis. And I'm, I was confident when he was taken out, it, there was no basis. The problem should, was, I should, still had to go without him for months. Was that, was that a comment uh, that you heard, Kate McGee, the, the, the length of time that this process takes? Yes, because what would happen was they would have a CPS investigation and then a school investigation, and those were not happening simultaneously, so you'd have to wait for one investigation to be Jennifer, completed. any way of speeding up this process in sure. 30 seconds so or ju- less? Yes, so I'd just like to say child sexual abuse is probably the number one public health crisis facing child children in the world. It's the highest leading cause of teen pregnancy, depression, substance abuse, addiction, trauma, PTSD, everything. So so the key here is we need our states and our governments to increase child protective service professionals, mm-hmm. increase detectives working on this case. And that would have to staff. speed up Correct. the process. It would speed it up. We need more support. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Jennifer Alvaro, thank you so much for joining us. Donna Hollingshead, thank you so much for joining us. Giselle Pelias, thank you for joining us. And Kate McGee, thank you for joining us. But welcome. you didn't join us, Kate. You were already here. <laughs> WAMU education coverage is supported in part by American Graduate Let's Make It Happen, a public media initiative made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And that's it for the show today, but there's always more happening online. You can browse the program's entire archive for free. So if you missed any shows this week, like yesterday's conversation about how our region engages with Confederate history, you can catch up there. You can also take the show with you anywhere you go by downloading our podcast. Don't forget to meet us back here tomorrow at noon. We'll explore what's at stake in the conversation about the future of the RFK Stadium site in D.C. And we'll be talking about the rise in interest in naturopathic medicine in our region. That's all happening at noon tomorrow. Until then, thank you for listening. I'm Kojo Nandi.